Section 4 is on pediatric orthopedics. Psychomotor skills developed in a child between the age 1 and 5 are as follows. Social smile at 2 months of age, head control at 3 months, child sits by 6 months, stands by 10 months of age, talks by 14 months and walks by 14 months. It's considered abnormal if child is not rolling by 6 months, not sitting by 8 months, not talking by 14 months and not walking by 18 months. Skeletal development in a child. Femoral epiphysis ossific center appears by the age of 4 months but at any, any time up to 11 months may be normal. Tarsal navicular does not ossify until 3 to 4 years of age. Ossification around the elbow can be remembered with the mnemonic CRITO which stands for capitulum, radial head, internal epicondyle, trochlea, olecranon and external epicondyle. And ossification center appear at ages 2, 5, 7, 9, 10 and 11 years respectively. Normal Beaumont's angle at the distal humeral articular surface is 72 degrees plus minus 4 which remains uniformly same from 2 to 13 years of age. Cervical spine in children C2, C3 pseudo subluxation should not exceed 3 millimeters. Odontoid fuses with the body by 3 to 6 years. At last dense interval is normal up to 5 millimeters in children. Center of ossification for the vertebral body of atlas appears sometime during the first year after birth. Odontoid fuses with the body between 3 to 6 years of age. This can easily be mistaken for fracture of the odontoid. Let's look into extremity growth in, ch in a child. Most growth occurs away from the elbow and at the knee joint. Considering the individual bones on their own, Humerus exhibits 80% of its growth proximally and 20% distally. Radius and ulna, 80% of the growth occurs at the wrist and 20% at the elbow. Femur exhibits 70% of the growth at the knee joint and 30% at the hip, whereas tibia and fibula have 60% of the growth at the knee joint and 40% at the ankle. Contribution of the individual bone in the overall length of the extremity is as follows. Upper limb 40% at the proximal humerus, 40% distal radius and ulna, 10% at the distal humerus and 10% proximal radius and ulna. Lower extremity 40% distal femur, 30% proximal tibia and fibula, 15% proximal femur and 15% at the ankle joint. Growth measurement can be carried out by using Anderson and Green growth chart which is not a straight line graph. This has been modified by Mosley's straight line graph for predicting limb length inequality at maturity. At least three readings at six months interval is essential to predict correctly the expected leg length discrepancy on these growth charts. Rough estimation of growth at the knee joint is 15 millimeters every year. 9 mm at the distal femur and 6 mm at proximal tibia and fibula. Normal lower limb alignments in a child to consider are number 1 femoral antiversion, number 2 coronal plane varus vulgus alignment, 3 metatarsus adduction and fourth one tibial torsion. Let's look into the first one femoral antiversion. It can normally be as high as 40 degrees at birth and is reduced to 15 degrees in adults. How to measure femoral antiversion? Murphy's technique of using CT measurement is the most popular. Staheli has described clinical measurement of femoral antiversion. During internal rotation of the hip with the subject lying prone, the greater trochanter is most prominent laterally when the neck of the femur is horizontal to the ground. Angle measured from the tibia to the vertical axis with the knee flex to 90, patient prone and neck of the femur horizontal to the ground is the antiversion angle. 
Abnormal antiversion is likely to be present if internal rotation exceeds 70 degrees and external rotation is less than 20 degrees. Number 2. Coronal plane where a svalgus alignment of the lower extremity. Any genuverum after the age of 2 should be investigated. Physiological genuverum up to 2 is normal. Physiological varus starts to correct and forms excessive vulgus by 4. Excessive vulgus is returned to normal vulgus alignment by the age of 6. Normal metaphyseal diaphyseal angle is less than 12 degrees at the age of 18 months. Number 3. Metatarsis adduction is quantified by drawing a line through heel bisector and noting which toe it intersects. Normally, the line should intersect between second and third toes. Normal foot progression angle at 4 to 16 years of age range between minus 8 to plus 16 degrees. Fourth aspect is tibial torsion. It's measured using transmalleolar axis. Transmalleolar axis will measure the tibial version and at birth normal tibial version is minus 4, 15 degrees. This increases to plus 5 degrees of external rotation by the end of first year, plus 10 degrees by mid-childhood and normal lateral rotation in adulthood is 20 to 24 degrees. Interpretation of anteroposterior pelvis x-ray in a child. Normal estabular index at one year is less than 30 degrees, at two years less than 25 and at three years less than 20 degrees. Ossific center of the femoral head appears at 4 months and appearance up to 11 months is normal. Hilgenreiner's line is the line through the triradiate cartilage. Normally, ossific nucleus of the femoral head is medial to Perkins line. And in a normal hip, Shenton's line is uninterrupted. Interpretation of foot x-rays. Anteroposterior view Calcaneal angle is called kite angle and is normally between 20 to 40 degrees. Dorsiflex lateral view of the foot is called turco view. Normal talocalcaneal angle on the lateral film is more than 35 degrees. Let's look into gait analysis. Some of the definitions to remember are kinematics is study of motion, kinetics forces that produce motion, Cadence, number of steps per unit of time. Stride, one cycle which includes right and left steps. First rocker is the first stage of ankle motion during the beginning of stance phase. Second rocker is the ankle motion when the foot is flat on the ground. Here body moves over a stationary foot. Third rocker is the ankle motion from the heel rise to toe off the ground. Gait cycle has 60% stance phase and 40% swing phase. First 10% and last 10% of the stance phase is double stance. Gait analysis is carried out in three different planes, sagittal, coronal and transverse planes. Important points to express about gait analysis are, number one, comment on his and or her stability in stance, number two, foot clearance in swing phase. Number three, pre-positioning of the foot for initial contact either heel or forefoot whether it is normal or abnormal. Number four, whether he has adequate step length. Number five, do you think his or her energy consumption is good enough or does he need any investigations to look into that? So five points, stability, clearance, pre-positioning, step length, and energy. Developmental dysplasia of the hip. Incidence 1 in a thousand. Risk factors are first born female, positive family history of DDH, breech presentation, associated torticollis, scoliosis or musculoskeletal abnormalities. Pathoetiological theories proposed are mechanical theory, maternal hormone induced theory, primary dysplasia theory or genetic theory. Diagnosis is considered in four different age groups. In a newborn, 
at 6 to 18 months of age, at walking age and after 3 years of age. At birth, Ortolani test is for dislocated hips. Here, hip reduces on abduction in a relaxed child. Barlow's test is a provocative test and examiner feels for the hip gliding over the edge of the establum as it dislocates from the socket. Galeazzi sign is apparent shortening of the dislocated hip and can be misleading in bilateral dislocations. What are the X-ray findings in DDH? Shenton's line is broken in DDH. Establular index is abnormal. Appearance of ossific nucleus may be delayed. Ossific nucleus is lateral to Perkins line and is only of value if ossific nucleus has appeared. Center edge angle greater than 20 degrees is abnormal. Treatment. Dislocation in a newborn is treated in a public harness. If harness does not stabilize the hip in 4 to 6 weeks, close reduction and spica is to be considered. Safe zone of Ramsey is a safe stable position of hip immobilization in a spica without excessive abduction to minimize the risk of AVN. Minimum of 20 degrees of safe zone is essential and 45 degrees of safe zone is preferable. Irreducible hip will need arthrography and open reduction if necessary. What do we look for while performing hip arthrography in DDH? Is it a dysplastic establum? Is the hip subluxed or dislocated? Can the hip reduce? Is there any soft tissue interposition which interferes with congruent reduction? Is there any pooling of the dye medially? Thorn sign is normal and look for inverted limbus if thorn sign is absent on the arthrography. What approaches are described for the open reduction of the hip? Number one, most commonly used approach is Smith-Peterson anterior approach. Skin incision for this approach is being modified by Somerville from ileoinguinal incision to bikini incision. Number two, anteromedial approach is described by Winstein and Ponsati but is not very popular probably because of its proximity to the vessels. Number three, Ludloff's or Ferguson approaches are medial approaches. Muscular interval is either anterior or posterior to the adductor brevis muscle. What are the pelvic osteotomies commonly talked about? Number one, Salter's innominate osteotomy which hinges at the pubic symphysis. Number two, Pemberton osteotomy which hinges at the triradiate cartilage. Number three, Steele's triple osteotomy consists of osteotomies of the ileum, pubis as well as ischium and rotates establum as one piece. Number four, two of the many periestabular osteotomies for the rotation of the establum described for dysplastic hips are Degas osteotomy and Gans technique in adolescent hips. These periestabular osteotomies are inherently stable osteotomies closer to the joint and gets better head coverage. Number five, salvage procedures in the dysplastic hips are Staheli shelf procedure and Chiari displacement osteotomy. What are the prerequisites for Salter nominate osteotomy? Number one, femoral head should be level with the establum. Number two, there should be no fixed flexion or adduction contracture. Number three, should be able to reduce the hip completely and concentrically. Number four, hip joint must be congruous. And number five, must have good hip range of motion. Kalamchi classification of avascular necrosis as a complication of CDH. Simple way to remember is type 1 ossific center not appeared by the age of 1. Type 2 damage to the lateral part of the physis resulting in vulgus neck. Type 3 damage to the growth plate more centrally resulting in cessation of growth of the femoral neck with overgrowth of greater trochanter and type 4 total involvement. Next
topic is leg calway perthes disease independently described condition by leg calway and perthes etiology of this condition is unknown trotas hypothesis says solitary retinacular blood blood supply between the age of 4 and 8 years makes the femoral head vulnerable for ischemia cafe's hypothesis is primary thickening and disorganization of growth plate with intraepiphyseal compression of blood supply to the ossification center resulting in ischemia incidence is 1 in 1200 between 3 and 12 years of age male to female ratio is 4 is to 1 and 15% bilateral waldenstrom's radiographic staging of the disease are number 1 stage of necrosis number 2 stage of resorption or fragmentation number 3 stage of reossification and 4 stage of remodeling in general necrotic and fragmentation stages last approximately 6 months each reossification for 1 and 1/2 years and remodeling for about 3 years there are three different ways of classifying perthes disease catral classification salter thompson's classification and herring's lateral pillar classification catral has classified perthes into four groups salter has described two groups and herring's lateral pillar classification has three groups catral classification number 1 central anterior head involvement less than 25% of the head involved here number 2 more than 25% of head involved but medial and lateral columns intact number 3 75% of the femoral head involved but intact medial column number 4 whole head involved salter classification number 1 less than half the femoral head involved and intact lateral pillar number 2 more than half of the head involved and lateral pillar is involved salter classification is based on crescent sign due to subchondral fractures herring lateral pillar classification compares the affected hip to the contralateral unaffected hip herring classification is done during the stage of fragmentation a b and c a lateral pillar is intact b height of the collapsed lateral pillar is less than 50% of the normal side c height of the collapsed lateral pillar is more than 50% of the normal side head at risk signs described by catrell are 1 lateral calcification 2 lateral subluxation 3 lucency proximal and distal to lateral physis otherwise called gages sign 4 metaphyseal cysts 5 horizontal physis stuhlberg rating system at maturity has been described as a radiological outcome measure of perthes disease moses concentric circles are used here to analyze specificity of the hip joint class 1 to class 5 class 1 has normal femoral head class 2 has spherical femoral head with short femoral neck and coxa magna class 3 has non spherical or ovoid femoral head which is not flat class 4 has got a flat femoral head as well as flat establum and class 5 has got flat femoral head but normal establum treatment of perthes disease is controversial options available are number 1 do nothing or supervised neglect number 2 ambulation abduction brace or a cast number 3 femoral varus osteotomies number 4 innominate osteotomies number 5 epiphysiodesis important clinical prognosticator is range of motion especially the hip abduction guidelines on the treatment of perthes by herring are number 1 patients who are less than 6 years of age there is no evidence that any form of treatment alters either the growth potential of physis or the outcome so principle in this group is to treat the symptoms number 2 patients who are 6 7 or 8 years of age early results suggest that herring subgroup b in this age group do better with containment methods group c in this age group results of any treatment are inconclusive number 3 patients who are 9 years or older 
Group A in this age group needs symptomatic treatment. Bracing in this adolescent age group is difficult and operative treatment has got a stronger argument in group B and C. Salvage procedures described are shelf arthroplasty or Chiari osteotomy for femoral head coverage. Proximal femoral vulgus osteotomy has been performed in selected cases to increase abduction particularly if hinge abduction is seen on arthrography. Rarely performed operation is advancement of the relatively enlarged greater trochanter. Slipped upper femoral epiphysis or SUFE, S -U -F -E. Incidence of this condition in black females is 6 to 7 per 100,000 population and in Caucasians it is 1 to 3 per 100,000 population. Etiological factors to consider are number one, anatomical. 10 degrees more than normal retroversion of the femoral head is found to be prevalent among the individuals who had slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Number two, maturation factors. Increased thickness of physis reduces its resistance to shear. And Sufi in girls almost always occurs before menarche. Number three, Structural abnormalities of the physis itself may be an etiological factor. Number four, endocrine influence. Incidence of bilateral SUFI is 70% in patients with endocrinopathy compared to 25% in those patients without any underlying endocrinopathies, which suggest endocrine influence as one of the causative factor. Number five is a triggering traumatic event may be an important precipitating factor. Sufi has clinically been classified as pre-slip, acute slip, chronic slip and acute on chronic slip. Dunn has classified Sufi into number one acute traumatic slip, number two chronic slip. Chronic slip is subclassified as A acute on chronic, B early or C late chronic slip. Radiological severity of the slip is classified as grade 1 or mild slip in which one third of the metaphysis is uncovered, grade 2 or moderate slip in which two thirds of the metaphysis is uncovered and grade 3 or severe slip is when more than two thirds of the metaphysis is uncovered. Southwick has classified the slip according to Southwick angle difference. Southwick angle difference less than 30 degrees is mild, between 30 and 60 degrees is moderate and more than 60 degrees is severe slip. Lauder in his classifi classification of stable or unstable Sufi has addressed the prognosis of the condition in relation to slip. Unstable Sufi is when patient is unable to tolerate any kind of weight on the affected hip. Unstable hip has got 47% satisfactory prognosis compared to 96% satisfactory prognosis in the stable group. Incidence of avascular necrosis in the stable group is nil, whereas avascular necrosis in unstable group is as high as 50%. Radiological findings in Sufi are 1. Decreased height of the epiphysis, 2 metaphyseal blanch sign, 3, trethovans line also called Kleen's line not intersecting the epiphysis of the femur. Chondrolysis is present when the width of the joint space difference is more than 2 millimeters thinner compared to the contralateral normal hip. Principles of treatment are 1 to prevent further slip and 2 to promote closure of phrysis. In severe slip even gentle manipulation before any surgical intervention is controversial. Ponsati and Winstein have suggested 5 pound traction before pinning in severe slips. Surgical options are number one, all mild and moderate slips will need pinning in situ which can often be technically demanding because of the displacement. Number two, severe slips may need a gentle reduction and pinning in situ which is controversial, b bone graft epiphysiodesis, c osteotomies and internal fixation. 
Some of the osteotomies described are subcapital osteotomy described by Dunn, extracapsular osteotomy of the base of the neck, intertrochantric osteotomy described by Southwick, and Sujioka described a rotational osteotomy of the femoral neck, which is again a technically demanding procedure. Main complications in Sufi are 1. Chondrolysis and 2. Avascular necrosis. Let's talk about bone dysplasia. Dysplasia refers to deformities caused by intrinsic bone disturbance. Dystrophy is the deformities caused by metabolic or nutritional deficiencies like mucopolysaccharidosis. Diastosis is termed when there is underlying mesodermal or ectodermal abnormality, for example, diastrophic dysplasia. These are the descriptions given by Rubin. Rubin has classified bone dysplasias into four main categories. Epiphyseal dysplasia, facial dysplasia, metaphyseal dysplasia, diaphyseal dysplasia. Each of these are subgrouped as A. Hypoplasias and B. Hyperplasias. So Rubin's classification is number one, epiphyseal dysplasia. A. Epiphyseal hypoplasia can be either failure of articular cartilage like spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia or failure of ossification center like multiple epiphyseal dysplasias. B. Epiphyseal hyperplasia is when there is excessive articular cartilage. Best example is dysplasia epiphysialis hemimelica, otherwise called Travers disease. Number two, facial dysplasia. A. Cartilage hypoplasia can be failure of proliferative zone as in achondroplasia or failure of hypertrophic zone as in metaphyseal diastostosis and cartilage hair hypoplasia. B. Cartilage hyperplasia, excessive cartilage proliferation as in hyperchondroplasia, Marfan syndrome or excess of hypertrophic cartilage as in enchondromatosis. Number three, metaphyseal dysplasias. A. Metaphyseal hypoplasia, which can be failure to form primary spongiosa as in hypophosphatasia failure to absorb primary spongiosa as in osteopetrosis or failure to absorb secondary spongiosa as in craniometaphyseal dysplasia. B. Metaphyseal hyperplasia which can be excessive spongiosa formation as in multiple exostosis. Number four is diaphyseal dysplasias. A. Diaphyseal hypoplasia which can be failure of periosteal bone formation or osteogenesis imperfecta or failure of endosteal bone formation as in idiopathic osteoporosis. B. Diaphyseal hyperplasia which can be excessive periosteal bone formation as in Engelmann's disease, progressive diaphyseal dysplasia or excessive endosteal bone formation as in hyperphosphatemia, juvenile Paget's disease and von Bochem's disease. Different descriptions of DOFs are as follows. Proportionate DOFism is decrease in both trunk and limb length. Disproportionate DOFism can be either short trunk or short limb. Short limb DOFism is again subdivided into rhizomelic that is proximal limb shortening, mesomelic that is middle limb shortening or acromelic which is distal limb shortening. Let's look into some of the dysplasias. Achondroplasia is an autosomal dominant condition with frequent new mutation. It's most common skeletal dysplasia. Clinical features are macrocephaly, frontal bossing, saddle nose, maxillary hypoplasia, mandibular prognathism, small mandible, trident hand, lumbar lordosis, genuverum, spinal stenosis and rhizomelic dwarfism. Achondroplastic have normal life expectancy. Orthopedic interventions 
in achondroplastics are mainly number one limb length procedures number two thoracolumbokyphosis which is usually self corrected but if it remains greater than 40 degrees by 5 to 6 years of age and associated with a single wedge shaped apical vertebra deterioration is most likely number three intervention for cervical and or lumbar lordosis only if symptomatic number four congenital lumbar canal stenosis may need decompression if symptomatic especially acute onset cauda equina syndromes in achondroplastics hypochondroplasia is an autosomal dominant condition clinical findings are similar to those of mild achondroplastics pseudo achondroplasia can either be autosomal dominant or recessive clinical features are rhizomelic shortening of extremities but facial features of achondroplasia are absent c1 c2 instability may be present in pseudo achondroplasia diastrophic dysplasia is an autosomal recessive condition clinical features are cauliflower ear rhizomelic shortening hitchhiker's thumb cervical spina bifida kyphosis scoliosis of the thoracolumbar spine spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia congenita is an autosomal dominant condition clinical features are odontoid hypoplasia with instability platyspondyly scoliosis and coxavera spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia tarda is a x linked recessive condition affecting boys clinical features are hip resembling perthes disease scoliosis occasional cervical instability multiple epiphyseal dysplasia is an autosomal dominant condition major clinical features are irregular epiphyseal ossific ossification with deformities hips knees and ankles are most commonly involved usually presents in late childhood spine is normal multiple osteocartilaginous exostosis or diaphyseal achalasia is an autosomal dominant condition clinical features are short stature multiple lumps asymmetric growth at the knee and ankles may lead to deformities leg length inequality usually about 4 cm and risk of malignant degeneration reported risk of malignant change vary from 1% to 20% radiological features in diaphyseal achalasia can be sessile or pedunculated bone growth lesions usually close to the metaphysis cortex of the lesion continues with the cortex of the bone with a homogeneous continuation of the medulla Di dysplasia epiphysialis hemimelica or traverse disease these are basically osteochondromas arising in the epiphysis and so involving the joint they are usually restricted to one side of the limb either medial or lateral and involve one of the limbs that's why this is called hemimelica one side of the epiphysis lateral or medial oleous disease or multiple enchondromas clinical presentations are usually angular deformities bony irregularities and limb length problems radiographically enchondromas can be seen in the metaphysis occasionally in the epiphysis enchondromas in the hand are almost always benign cleidocranial dysplasia is an autosomal dominant condition hyperplasia or aplasia of the clavicle with wide symphysis pubis short middle phalanx of fifth finger Diaphyseal dysplasia or Camurati Engelmann syndrome is also an autosomal dominant condition. Radiological features are thickened diaphysis with narrowing of the medullary cavity and fusiform shaped long bones. Bone changes persist in adulthood. Appert syndrome or acrocephalosyndactyly is an autosomal dominant condition. affected individual will have short anteroposterior diameter of the skull high full forehead flat occiput 
and craniosynostosis affecting mainly coronal sutures. Mucopolysaccharidosis is a disorder is resulting from lysosomal enzyme deficiency. Mainly four types are described, type 1 to type 4, Hurlers, Hunters, San Filippo and Marcio. Type 2 is X-linked recessive and rest of the three are autosomal recessive conditions. Patients with type 1 hurlers and type 2 hunters excrete excessive amounts of dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate in the urine. Type 3 San Filippo syndrome is the most common mucopolysaccharidosis and these patients excrete excess heparin sulfate in urine. Excessive keratin sulfate in the urine can be detected in type 4 mucopolysaccharidosis or Marcio syndrome. Nail patella syndrome is an autosomal dominant condition. Features of nail patella syndrome are number one, nails are grooved, small or absent, especially on the thumb. Number two, knee anomalies, patella bipartite, small or absent patella, femoral condyles can be hypoplastic, osteochondritis, desiccants of the femur or talus can also be seen. Elbow abnormalities are capitellar hypoplasia, cubitus vulgus, flexion contractures and dislocated radius. Number four, pelvic x-ray will have iliac horns in nail patella syndrome. Fibrous dysplasia is benign sporadic pathologic condition that affects skeletal development. This is often referred to as McCune Albright syndrome. Please note, Albright osteodystrophy is to do with pseudo hyperparathyroidism. Fibrous dysplasia can be monoostotic or polyostotic, affecting multiple bones. Caffiole pigmentation can be one of the feature in fibrous dysplasia. Deformity of the proximal femur due to fibrous dysplasia is called shepherd croup deformity. Fibro dysplasia ossificans progressiva or also called myositis ossificans progressiva presents with multiple soft tissue ossifications and is different from fibrous dysplasia. Increased bones and density can be due to following disorders malariostosis, osteopoikilosis and osteopetrosis. The difference in these three conditions is in the distribution and characteristics of these increased bony densities. What are the different Marfanoid disorders? Number one, Marfan syndrome. Number two, homocysteine urea. Number three, congenital contractural arachnodactyly. Number four, Ashard syndrome. Number five, Stickler syndrome, otherwise called hereditary arthroophthalmopathy. Please note that Marfan syndrome is one of the many disorders under the heading of Marfanoid disorders. Marfan syndrome. Systems involved in Marfan syndrome are skeletal system, ocular involvement, cardiovascular system, pulmonary involvement, skin and central nervous system involvement. To diagnose Marfan syndrome one should have positive family history, skeletal involvement and involvement of two other systems. At least one must be a major manifestation. Skeletal features in Marfan syndrome are anterior chest deformity, long narrow limbs, arachnodactyly, vertebral deformity, tall stature, high narrow arched palate, increased appendicular joint hypermobility and protrusio estabuli. What is arthrogryposis? Arthrogryposis is a non-specific term describing conditions characterized by congenital non-progressive limitation of movements due to soft tissue contractures affecting two or more joints. Some of the conditions under the heading of arthrogryposis are number one arthrogryposis multiplex congenita which is the classic arthrogryposis number two Larsen syndrome number three 
Freeman Sheldon Whistling Face Syndrome Number 4 Mobius Syndrome Number 5 Pterygium Syndrome Etiology of arthrogryposis is unknown Typical clinical features of arthrogryposis are Dislocated hips Flexion contractures of knees Club feet Vertical talus Upper extremity internally rotated and wrist flexed due to contractures. Larsen syndrome presents with multiple joint dislocations, mainly hips, hyperextended and dislocated knees. Vascular abnormalities affecting the skeleton are number one, Klippel Trinoni Weber syndrome, which consists of vascular anomalies, hemangiomas, with hemihypertrophy of the limbs. Number two, Mufici syndrome consists of multiple enchondromas of Olius syndrome with cutaneous hemangiomas. This condition has a very high risk of malignancy. Number three, Stooge Weber syndrome is mainly hemangiomas with neurological sequelae and meningeal hemangiomas. Number four, blue rubber bleb nevus syndrome is also a vascular abnormality affecting the skeleton. Neurofibromatosis. All amongst those caused by a single gene defect, this is the most prevalent skeletal disorder. There are two types, neurofibromatosis type 1 and type 2. Neurofibromatosis type 1 is von Recklinghausen's disease, incidence 1 in 4000, autosomal dominant condition with chromosome 17 gene locus abnormalities. Diagnostic criteria are more than two of the following is essential to diagnose this condition. Number one, more than five cafeole spots, more than five millimeters in diameter in a child and more than 15 millimeters in an adult. Number two, more than two neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma. Number three, axillary or inguinal freckles. Number four, more than two iris hematomas called leash nodules. Number five, osseous lesions like long bone pseudarthrosis, dystrophic curve of spine or spinoid abnormalities. Number six, first degree relative affected with neurofibromatosis and number seven, optic glioma. Neurofibromatosis type two is central invol involvement on chromosomal 22 locus abnormalities. CNS manifestations are predominant in type two. Orthopedic manifestations of type one neurofibromatosis are number one, scoliosis, number two, overgrowth of bone, number three, pseudarthrosis, number four, cystic lesions in the bone, number five, metaphyseal fibrosis, number six, pressure erosions of the bone, number seven, overgrowth of the extremity. Scoliosis in neurofibromatosis can be dystrophic or non-dystrophic. Non-dystrophic is like idiopathic scoliosis. Dystrophic has got severe degree of apical rotation, platyspondyly as well as vertebral scalloping. Dystrophic spinal curves are aggressive and if it is more than 30 degrees anterior and posterior fusion should be considered. Rate of non-union is high in scoliosis surgery for neurofibromatosis. Osteogenesis imperfecta these are the group of disorders with type 1 collagen abnormalities causing bone fragility. Silence has classified osteogenesis imperfecta into type 1 to type 4. Autosomal dominant types are less severe and they are type 1 and type 4. Type 2 and 3 are autosomal recessive. Type 2 is usually not compatible with life. Type 3 is one of the conditions which is often seen with a severe degree of osteogenesis imperfecta in the clinical practice. 
type 1 and 2 have blue sclera type 3 and 4 do not have blue sclera radial club hand is a spectrum ranging from hypoplasia to complete absence of preaxial upper limb extremity and can be associated with number one blood dyscrasias like Fanconi syndrome or thrombocytopenia absent radius syndrome otherwise called TAR TAR syndrome number two congenital heart defects like Holt Oram syndrome number three craniofacial anomalies like Nagar syndrome number four congenital scoliosis in Vata Vactril syndrome or Klippelfield syndrome can be associated with radial club hand Klippelfield syndrome this is a clinical syndrome of low hairline short neck and decreased range of neck movements cervical spine fusion may be associated with instability or stenosis skeletal associated conditions are scoliosis in 60 percent of the patients sprengel deformity in about 30 percent and upper extremity or hand anomalies non-skeletal associations with clipple field syndrome may be genitourinary hearing cardiac or facial asymmetry fetal alcohol syndrome commonly presents with growth disturbances CNS dysfunction and dysmorphic phase orthopedic problems in fetal alcohol syndrome are contractures synostosis hip dislocations club feet and congenital cervical fusion some of the chromosomal abnormalities to remember are number one down syndrome two Turner syndrome three Noonan syndrome four Klenfelter syndrome five Kraidu Shah syndrome down syndrome is trisomy 21 and presents with mental retardation orthopedic problems in downs are number one delayed walking number two lax ligaments and plano valgus feet number three c1 c2 instability number four idiopathic scoliosis number five hip dislocations number six slipped capital femoral epiphysis and perthes disease number seven patella subluxation or dislocation and number eight metatarsis adductus or hallux valgus what do we need to know about muscular dystrophy and neuromuscular disorders neuromuscular disorders are broadly classified as myopathies and neuropathies myopathies have abnormalities in the muscle in neuropathies muscle changes are secondary to abnormalities or disorders of the neuromuscular junction peripheral nerve or anterior horn cell investigation and evaluation of these disorders are number one detailed history particularly family history number two look for Gower's sign and detailed neurological examination number three serum creatinine phosphokinase CPK values are more than 20 times normal in Duchenne as well as Becker's muscular dystrophy CPK is mildly raised with the dystrophies Dystrophin immunoblock test differentiates from dystrophy. Number five, DNA mutation analysis. Number six, electromyogram. Number seven, nerve conduction studies show abnormalities, slow nerve conduction in the peripheral nerve diseases, and normal conduction velocities in spinal muscular atrophy. Number eight, muscle biopsy rectus femoris muscle is used for proximal myopathies and gastrocnemius for distal myopathies number nine nerve biopsy sural nerve is the most commonly used number ten electrocardiogram to look for abnormalities in Duchenne muscular dystrophy Frederick's ataxia and dystrophia myotonica spinal muscular atrophy has been classified into four types mainly based on the age of onset of the condition Type 1 is Werdening-Hoffmann's syndrome, diagnosed before 6 months of age. 
it's usually not compatible with life. Type 2 is diagnosed between 6 to 12 months of age. Type 3 is diagnosed between 12 months to 3 years of age. And type 4 is kugelberg wallander syndrome is diagnosed after 3 years of age. Spinal muscular atrophy, all types are autosomal recessive gene defects on chromosome 5. Mainly affected cells are anterior horn cells. Friedrich's ataxia is spinocerebellar degeneration. Pest cavus and scoliosis are orthopedic problems in Friedrich's ataxia. Hereditary motor and sensory neuropathies are classed as type 1 is called rosy levy or hypertrophic charcomery tooth. Type 2 is otherwise called charcomery tooth disease neuronal form. Type 3 hereditary sensory motor neuropathy or digerine sotas syndrome and type 4 is refsum's disease. Main manifestations of hereditary sensory motor neuropathies are progressive equino varus feet, clawing of toes, gait abnormalities, hip dysplasias and scoliosis. Life expectancy with hereditary sensory neuropathy is normal. To sum it all, number one, Neuropathies can be spinal muscular dystrophy, charcomery tooth disease, viral neuropathies. Number two, myopathies can be Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, Becker's muscular dystrophy, facio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy, limb girdle dystrophy, emery diffuse muscular dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy, and congenital myopathy. Cerebral palsy is our next topic. It's difficult to classify cerebral palsy under one group as such because of mixed involvement. It can grossly be categorized as spastic, athetoid, and motion disorders. Anatomical way of categorizing cerebral palsy is quadriplegic CP, diplegic CP, hemiplegic CP, and total global involvement. Ambulation potential is classified by Hoffer. 1. Community ambulators. 2. Household ambulator. 3. Therapeutic ambulator or ambulation as a physiotherapy measure. And 4th group non-ambulators. Deformities in the cerebral palsy are mainly dynamic deformities, fixed contractures, Contractures associated with joint subluxation or dislocation. Assessment of a child begins with the ambulation potential as well as level of intelligence. Gait analysis is helpful preoperative assessment tool in cerebral palsies. Procedures available to reduce muscular spasm, prevent deformities and to correct deformities in CPR. Number one, dorsal, dorsal rhizotomy. Number two, botulinum toxins. Number three, multiple simultaneous bony procedures after gait analysis. Deformities to look for in CPR. Number one, pelvic obliquity and scoliosis. Primary pelvic obliquity due to iliotibial band contracture or secondary obliquity due to scoliosis should be dealt with before hips are tackled in CP. Number two, lower limb problems in cerebral palsy. Hip subluxation and dislocation. Non-ambulators have around 50% chances of subluxing or dislocating the hip in CP, whereas ambulators rarely dislocate. Radiographic monitoring of the hips in CP. Center edge angle or CE angle of Weiberg or number two migration percentage of Reimer or Reimer's index hip tends to dislocate rapidly when migration percentage exceeds 50 and the general consensus is that if the migration percentage is less than 50 percent soft tissue procedures are often successful and if the migration percentage is more than 50 percent bony procedures may be needed Dislocated hip in CPs present with 
Number one, perineal hygiene problem. Number two, fractures of the lower extremities, extremities. And number three, pain if left untreated. Prevention is better than cure. Only screening test described is X-ray films at a regular interval. Procedures available for subluxing hips in CPR closed or open adductor release, iliopsoas release, femoral derotation varus osteotomies, pelvic osteotomies for head coverage and Chiari osteotomy of the pelvis as a salvage procedure. Cordyceps plasty is the treatment advocated for knee extension contractures. Hamstring release are carried out for fixed flexion contractures of the knee. Popliteal angle is the angle of the leg to the vertical axis with the patient supine hip flexed to 90 degrees and knee extended. Normal popliteal angle is about 20 degrees and more than 40 degrees popliteal angle will probably need surgical hamstring release. Few words on rectus femoris transfer in CPs. Normal action of rectus femoris is biphasic. During swing phase of gait cycle, concentric contraction of the proximal rectus flexes the hip joint and eccentric contraction of the distal rectus muscle flexes the knee joint. Thus foot is cleared from the ground during swing phase. In cerebral palsy, this dual action is taken away in some patients resulting in simultaneous contraction at the hip as well as at the knee joint resulting in extension of the knee joint during swing phase. Gait analysis and ENMG studies are done to confirm this pathology. This is an indication for rectus femoris transfer to knee flexors so that foot is, foot is cleared from the ground during swing phase. Foot deformity in CP can be number one equinus deformity, number two equino varus deformity, number three vulgus deformity and number four calcaneo vulgus deformity. Surgical procedures for foot deformities in CP are always individually judged. Number one in equinus deformity gait electromyography is helpful to look for associated proximal limb abnormalities which may need to be dealt with before correcting the foot deformity. Number two, equinovarus can be fixed or dynamic. Dynamic equinovarus split anterior tibial tendon transfer and fixed equinovarus soft tissue release with bony procedures may be necessary. Number three, in vulgus deformity and calcaneo vulgus feet, grice Hind food stabilization is a bony procedure where extra articular subtalar arthrodesis is carried out using iliac crest bone graft. Gait analysis in cerebral palsy principles are the same as described before. Number one, stability in stance phase. Number two, foot clearance in swing phase. Number three, normal heel initial contact. Number four, step length and most important in cerebral palsy is number five energy conservation which is often abnormal in CPs. Spina bifida and myelomeningocele is our next topic. Myelomeningocele is congenital defect of the vertebrae and neural element. Myelomeningocele can be spina bifida occulta, meningocele, myelomeningocele or lipomeningocele. Spinal dysraphism is a term used to categorize congenital defects of the neural tube. Commonly associated disorders are Arnold Chiari malformation, hydrocephalus, hydromyelia, diastomatomyelia, and spinal cord tethering. Deformities develop in the meningomyelocele because of number one, muscle imbalance, number two, intrauterine deformities due to uterine positioning, number three, postural contractures developed during growth. Number four, spasticity secondary to neurological problems like hydrocephalus or Chiari malformation. Number five, progressive deformities during growth associated with muscle imbalance leading to hip subluxations and dislocations. 
management in myelomeningocele depends on number one ambulation potential number two spasticity number three associated neurologic problem number four intelligence level number five fractures joint stiffness and deformities and number six obesity functional levels in myelomeningocele are classified into number one thoracic level which has no function in the voluntary muscles crossing the hip joint hip joints are usually not dislocated they are ambulators only with high standing brace HKAFO orthosis common major problem in this group is scoliosis number two high lumbar level is mainly L1 L2 hip flexion and adduction is present but abductors are non functioning orthopedic common problem is dislocation of the hip treatment of hip dislocation depends on ambulation potential of the patient number 3 low lumbar level is mainly L4 L5 hips are not significantly affected in this group common orthopedic problem is calcaneous deformity of the ankle and foot ulceration patient is usually mobile with KAFO that is knee ankle foot orthosis number four sacral level common orthopedic problems at sacral level spina bifida are foot problems clotos and cavus deformities may require shoe support and all of these patients will be community ambulators Hoffer classification of ambulation potential community ambulators household ambulators therapeutic ambulators and non ambulators money loss has summarized the principles in meningomyocele treatment number one surgery should be directed to the anticipated adult need number two single surgical procedure and a least possible surgical procedure to correct the deformity is advised number three single session surgery and early weight pairing is educated number four muscle imbalance should always be corrected latex allergy is well known in patients with myelomeningocele orthopedic problems to deal in spina bifida patients are number one pelvic obliquity and scoliosis number two hip contractures iatrogenic abduction contractures may result from prolonged abduction splinting in these patients Oberyant procedure is the release of tight iliotibial band to release fixed abduction deformity of the hip due to tight iliotibial band unilateral dislocation in patients with low lumbar or sacral level deficits should be treated high bilateral dislocations are best left alone with high myelomeningocele surgical techniques for hip deformities in spina bifida are soft tissue releases soft tissue transfers and bony procedures soft tissue releases for adduction and flexion contractures are adductors and iliopsoas release muscle transfers are to supplement weak abductors abductors are supplied by low lumbar and sacral division of plexus and are commonly paralyzed in myelomeningocele charard's procedure is the transfer of iliopsoas muscle through a window in the ilium to greater tuberosity aim is to provide abduction of the hip using iliopsoas muscle bony procedures are varus osteotomies or estabuloplasties or combined procedures depending on the correction needed to be achieved number 3 knee deformities in myelomeningocele principles of treatment are the same orthotics and joint mobilization soft tissue procedures to release flexion contractures and quadriceps plasty to release extension contractures of the knee torsional deformities in the lower extremity in myelomeningocele number 1 external torsional deformity can be treated with twister cable or surgical management external rotation deformity of the tibia due to iliotibial band contracture will need release of the contracture number 2 
internal torsional deformities can be treated with twister cables and in older children surgical management either muscle transfers or bonus procedures may be necessary number four is foot deformities in spina bifida they are again managed depending on the type of deformity and principles of treatment deformities are equinus equinovarus valgus vertical talus cavus or calcaneo valgus feet special care is needed for the trophic ulcers associated with myelomeningocele patients what do we need to know about focal femoral deficiencies focal femoral deficiency is characterized by reduction in the osseous material of the bone producing leg length discrepancy in the femur there are different classifications adopted for this condition two main groups are one total deficiency and two partial deficiency proximal focal femoral deficiency can be associated with coxa vera or fibula hemimelia in 50% of patients other associated deformities are knee ligamentous laxity abnormal or absent posterior cruciate as well as anterior cruciate ligaments akins classification is type a b c and d akins classification has got mainly three components number 1 femoral head in type a and b is present type c and d femoral head is absent number 2 femoral segment in type a is short in type b is short with proximal bony tuft type c is short usually proximally tapered and femoral segment in type d is short and deformed number 3 acetabulum in type a is normal type b is adequate acetabulum in type c is severely dysplastic and acetabulum in type d is absent connection between the segments of the femoral head according to akins classification are type a segments are connected type b there is no connection between the head and shaft type c no articular relationship is present and type d hip joint is absent in brief femoral head in a and b is present femoral head in c and d is absent acetabulum is normal in a adequate in b severely dysplastic in c and absent in d treatment depends on whether the hip is stable or whether the hip is unstable if the hips are unstable procedures are described to create hip joint using the knee joint minor degree of pffd will require leg lengthening procedures oneness rotation plasty is one of the techniques described to treat the associated fibular hemimelia coxa vera winstein has classified coxa vera in different groups number 1 coxa vera associated with hypoplastic femur or focal femoral deficiency number 2 coxa vera associated with congenital skeletal dysplasias like multiple epiphyseal dysplasia spondylometaphyseal dysplasia or achondroplasia number 3 acquired coxa vera either traumatic or metabolic disease like rickets or it may be secondary to perthes number 4 adolescent coxa vera in association with sufi and five idiopathic infantile coxa vera let's look into infantile idiopathic coxa vera incidence is 1 in 25000 births etiology may be a vascular abnormality triangular piece of bone is noted in the inferior portion of the neck associated with the increasing varus deformity This metaphyseal fragment of bone seems to reflect abnormal metaphyseal bone formation by the medial physis after it has assumed the more vertical orientation associated with the increasing varus. Clinical presentation 70% of the patients present with a limp. 
25% of idiopathic coxa vera are bilateral and will have waddling gait. 5% of these present with back and leg pain. Leg length discrepancy is a very rare presentation. Radiographic assessment of coxa vera. Hilgenreiner epiphyseal or HE angle. If greater than 60 degree, corrective surgery is considered. Less than 40 deg 45 degrees of HE angle, spontaneous correction will occur and between 45 and 60 degrees, outcome is uncertain and carefully observed. Principles of surgery in Cox Savera are Number 1. To correct the varus deformity. Number 2. To correct femoral retroversion. And number 3. To promote ossification of the physis. Powell's Y osteotomy is popular. Rotational profile abnormalities of the lower extremity in children is our next topic. Normal development of femoral version is 40 degrees of antiversion at birth, 24 degrees at 10 years of age, 16 degrees of antiversion by mid or late adolescence. Transmalleolar axis will measure the tibial version and at birth normal tibial version is minus 15 degrees. This increases to plus 5 degrees of external rotation by the end of first year, plus 10 degrees by mid-childhood and normal lateral rotation in adulthood is 20 to 24 degrees. Average foot progression angle at 4 to 16 years of age is plus 4.2 degrees, normal range being minus 8 to plus 16. Towing out deformity Average towing out for a normal child 4 to 5 years old is 2.8 degrees and increases to 7.3 degrees at age 16. Towing in deformity is either due to increased femoral antiversion or internal tibial torsion or foot deformities like metatarsis adductus. Various deformity at the knee can also present with towing in. Treatment. Staheli has mentioned less than 1% of the cases will require surgical correction for abnormal rotational profile. Orthosis have no place here. Leg length discrepancy in children. Common causes are post infectious, avascular necrosis of the femur, post traumatic, congenital anomalies, or focal deficiencies. Evaluation of leg length discrepancy is done by number one, tape measurement or block method, number two, radiographic evaluation using x rays, number three, CT scanogram with wrist bone age films. Beware of fixed flexion deformity of the knee here. At least three evaluations are required separately with an average gap of six months to predict accurately the leg length discrepancy at puberty. Wrist films are read using Grulich and Pyle Atlas. Number four, tomogram or computed tomography to evaluate growth plate pars. Growth charts are Green and Anderson tables or straight line chart by Mosley. Treatment options. Number one, observation and wait to correct spontaneously. Number two, no intervention if discrepancy is less than 2 cm. Number 3, shoe lifts. Number 4, epiphysiodesis. Number 5, limb lengthening initially introduced by Wagner, modified by DeBastiani using orthofix. And at present, best technique is Elisarau ring fixator. Number 6, chondrodiastasis may gain some leg length but high chances of epiphyseal fusion after chondrodiastasis is observed. So this technique is attempted at the end of growth period. Physial bars. Number one, peripheral bridge, common cause, Salter Harris two fractures. Number two, linear bridge, extend from one metaphysis to another site on the same metaphysis, is usually after Salter Harris two fractures. Number three, central bar, common cause is infection. Epiphysiodesis can either be done percutaneous or open. 
famist technique is open technique more popular is percutaneous epiphyseal disease under image control osteochondritis desiccans of the knee in children defined as the impending or actual separation of osteochondral fragments from the cartilaginous surface etiology is unknown combination of trauma and blood supply has been blamed osteochondral fragmentation leads to osteoarthritis diagnosis is done either arthroscopically or on x-rays key view is the tunnel view x-ray in 25% of the cases only tunnel view shows the pathology lesions causing symptoms due to fragmentation are classically anterior to blumensart's line blumensart's line is a radiographic shadow produced by the roof of the intercondylar notch on the lateral knee x-rays common sites for osteochondritis desiccans are intercondylar aspect of the medial femoral condyle which is about 75% of all the cases weight bearing surface of the medial femoral condyle in 10% weight bearing surface of the lateral femoral condyle 10% and anterior intercondylar groove of the patella in 5% of all cases papas has classified the categories according to the age on detection of osteochondritis desiccans category 1 is below the age of 12 and has excellent prognosis category 2 between 12 and 20 years and category 3 above 20 years management in the category 1 is non operative category 2 is rest and observation intervention only if symptomatic gul has done arthroscopic classification of osteochondritis desiccans type 1 intact lesion 1 to 3 cm type 2 early lesions of separation or early signs of separation type 3 partially detached type 4 bony crater filled with fibrous tissue treatment options after failed conservative management in gul's category 3 options are drilling of the lesion or drilling the lesion with bone grafting grade 4 lesions may need autologous chondrocyte culture transfer pediatric leg deformities genu verum there are two types of blount's disease number 1 infantile variety diagnosed under the age of 3 years and number 2 adolescent variety or late onset blount's disease in which age of onset is more than 4 years infantile tibia vera or blount's disease has multifactorial etiology 60% have bilateral involvement differential diagnosis physiological bow leg which usually disappears by the age of 2 decreasing metaphyseal diaphyseal angle in serial x rays is the best indicator of better prognosis number 2 skeletal dysplasia number 3 metabolic conditions like renal osteodystrophy dietary hypophosphatemic rickets number 4 infection number 5 post traumatic and number 6 is tumors classification of blount's disease is done by langelskjold and riska langelskjold has classified this into six categories type 1 medial metaphyseal beaking type 2 cartilage filled depression in the metaphyseal beaking with medial epiphyseal wedging type 3 type 2 with ossification at the inferomedial corner of epiphysis type 4 epiphyseal ossification fill the metaphyseal depression type 5 double epiphyseal plate and type 6 medial facial closure up to type 4 restoration of alignment is still possible treatment of blount's disease under 3 years conservative measures are explored over 4 years correction of the deformity is indicated if it is more than type 4 deformity various types of osteotomies or elisara ring fixator can be used
three types of tibial bowing are number one postromedial bowing which is relatively benign variety and main problem with this is progressive leg length discrepancy in 33% of these patients number two anterolateral bowing of tibia and fibula is ominous sign suggestive of pre pseudoarthrosis or pseudoarthrosis of tibia tibial hemimelia also presents as anterolateral bowing number 3 anteromedial bowing commonest disorder is fibula hemimelia which is the commonest long bone deficiency encountered in the pediatric age group infantile tibial nonunion is classified by boyd type 1 bone with a, with a defect number 2 bone with hourglass constriction spontaneous fractures are possible in this type type 3 bone cysts are seen type 4 sclerotic segment without diaphyseal narrowing type 5 is associated with dysplastic fibula and type 6 intraosseous neurofibroma or schwannoma type 2 and type 6 are associated with neurofibromas treatment prophylactic treatment is bracing in established nonunion options are number 1 resection and intramedullary rodding and bone grafting williams or sheffield rods are commonly used number 2 resection and vascularized fibula bone graft and number 3 elisa of fixator excision of the abnormal segment and bone transport amputation is an acceptable functional salvage procedure amputation should never be performed through the pseudoarthrosis because of the danger of bone overgrowth most commonly performed amputations are symes or boyd type of amputations through knee amputations are also advocated Symes amputation is suturing the calcaneal periosteum to the distal tibia and Boyd's amputation retains part of the calcaneum as a weight bearing support which is fixed to the distal tibia. Tibial hemimelia. Tibial hemimelia can either be autosomal dominant or recessive. Associated anomalies are scoliosis, hip dysplasia, bifurcation of the femur, adduction or polydactyly of the feet cardiac genito urinary and gastrointestinal system abnormalities tarsal coalition especially talocalcaneal coalition exist universally in this condition classification is by kalamchi type 1 more than 45 degrees of fixed flexion and initial radiographs show absent tibia type 2 25 to 45 degrees of knee flexion contracture with initial radiographs revealing proximal tibia type 3 most of the tibia is present with distal tibiofibular diastasis treatment type 1 early knee disarticulation and pylon type prosthesis type 2 proximal tibiofibular fusion later on followed by symes amputation type 3 reconstructive procedures are possible fibula hemimelia anteromedial bowing with a skin dimple over the apex of the associated tibia is the common presentation leg length discrepancy is always associated kalamchi and Achman's classification of fibula hemimelia is type 1 partial or incomplete absence of fibula type 2 entire fibula is absent type 3 is added by coventry as bilateral fibula hemimelia other classification of fibula hemimelia is by let type a unilateral expected leg length discrepancy less than 6 cm type b unilateral expected leg length discrepancy at maturity 6 to 10 cm type c unilateral expected leg length discrepancy more than 10 cm type d bilateral disease so let's classification is a b c and d 
treatment addressed to two main problems. Number one, leg length discrepancy. Elisera method is popular. If predicted leg length discrepancy is greater than 20 centimeters, Symes or Boyd's amputation is preferred. Number two, ankle and foot deformities. Treatment is individually tailored. Let's look into pediatric foot deformities, the club foot. Incidence, 1.24 per 1,000 live births. Incidence in first degree relatives is double. Theories of pathogenesis are germplast defect, developmental arrest theory, fetal theory or mechanical block theory, neurogenic theory is defect in the nerve supply to the muscle, Myogenic theory is primary defect in the muscle. Vascular theory is diminution of the arterial supply during development. And lastly, theory of retracting fibrosis. Pathoanatomy or deformities in the club foot are number one, equinus deformity, number two, heel varus deformity, number three, forefoot adductus and supination. Number five, cavus deformity. Ponsati has said, the goal of treatment of congenital club foot is a functional, pain-free, plantigrade foot with good mobility and without calluses that does not necessitate the wearing of modified shoes. Treatment options are manipulation and casting, operative treatment, and treatment of the residual deformity. Radiographic assessment of club foot Talocalcaneal angle and talometatarsal angles. Dorsiflexed lateral view, talocalcaneal angle more than 35 degrees is abnormal. Anteroposterior kite view, talocalcaneal angle 20 to 40 degrees is normal and less than 20 degrees is abnormal as in club feet. Taylor's first metatarsal angle is normally 0 to 20 degrees and it is negative in club foot. Principles of surgical intervention is to obtain plantigrade foot before walking. About 9 to 12 months of age is preferred age for surgical correction. Some surgeons do advocate early surgeries. Demaglio classification of club foot is 1. Stiff or irreducible 2. Severe or slightly reducible 3. Mild or partially reducible for postural or totally reducible. Harris and Walker classification is grade 1, equinus less than 10 degrees, grade 2, equinus 15 to 20 degrees, and grade 3, equinus more than 20 degrees. Structures to release at surgery depend on the deformities to correct. Equinus correction need releasing following structures, Achilles tendon, ankle capsule, subtalar capsule, posterior talofibular ligament, flexor hallucis, flexor digitorum, tibialis posterior, and Henry's knot. Heel varus correction will need releasing all the above structures, lateral structures, most important one is calcaneofibular ligament. Forefoot adductors will need talonavicular and calcaneocuboid joint releases along with adductor hallucis release. Cavus deformity can be corrected by releasing plantar ligament along with rest of the tight tendons on the medial side of the ankle joint. Operative technique needs planning of incisions and extent of soft tissue release. Incisions are either Turco's postromedial incision or Cincinnati incision or two incision technique, medial and lateral. Most popular nowadays is Cincinnati incision. Principles of surgical releases can be one of the two schools of thoughts. Number one, Turco advocated postromedial release retaining subtalar joint interosseous ligament and lateral structures. Number two, McKay's extensive postromedial and postrolateral releases done either with Cincinnati approach or two incision approaches in which he advocated release of subtalar joint, ankle joint, as well as lateral structures of the ankle joint. 
Structures to avoid overcorrection are number one, avoid dividing deep deltoid ligament. Number two, avoid extensive release of interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. Number three, avoid over displacement of the navicular bone. Number four, avoid Achilles and tibialis posterior over lengthening. Number five, avoid over correcting in the cast after extensive release. Residual deformities after club foot correction surgeries can be dynamic deformities, fixed deformities or four foot deformities. Principles of treatment for residual deformities are either shortening the lateral column of the foot or lengthening the medial column of the foot. Dynamic deformities can be dealt with tendon transfer operations either tibialis anterior or tibialis posterior split transfers Fixed deformities over the age of three to four years usually require bony procedures along with soft tissue releases. Popular procedures are number one, medial soft tissue release with Dwyer osteotomy, number two, medial soft tissue release with Dilvin Evans procedure, number three, soft tissue release with Lich Bloss procedure, number four, Elisera lengthening and correction. Bony osteotomy in the modified Dwyer's procedure is closing wedge calcaneal osteotomy. Dilwyn Evans procedure is excision of calcaneo cuboid joint and Litblos procedure is wedge excision of lateral calcaneus proximal to calcaneo cuboid joint. Four foot deformities are addressed by number one bony procedures described by Berman Gartland or soft tissue procedures of tarso metatarsal joint described by Heyman and Herndon. Number two, salvage techniques are triple arthrodesis, Norton Dunn technique, Denison Fulford or Lambrinidi technique. Talectomy is also one of the salvage procedure. Other complications to remember after corrective surgical procedures of club feet are rock a bottom foot or skew foot. Skew foot is vulgus hind foot with various four foot deformities. Pescavus. Pescavus is defined as fixed equinus deformity of the four foot on the hind foot. Coleman block test is often helpful. Most important disorder to consider is Charcot tooth disease. Other causes can be spina bifida and tethered cord syndrome. Benign physiologic cavus foot is a diagnosis of exclusion. Treatment depends on whether it is flexible or rigid. Options are number one plantar release, number two Robert Jones procedure which is transfer of extensor hyalocyst longus to the first metatarsal and fusion of IP joint. Number three bony procedures like calcaneal and metatarsal osteotomies. Number four, inflexible deformities, tendon transfers are described.